Whoop. All right, and now please allow me to introduce Dr. Charles Chip Bachman. Dr. Bachman received his uh, Bachelor's of Arts in Physics from Princeton University in June 1984, and his Master's in Science and PhD degrees in Physics from Brown University in 1986 and 1990. For 23 years, he was a research physicist with the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. During his last 10 years at NRL, he was the head of the Coastal Science and Interpretation Section in the Coastal and Ocean Remote Sensing Branch within NRL's Remote Sensing Division. In 2013, he accepted a faculty position here at the Rochester Institute of Technology, where he's currently the Frederick and Anna B. White Weedman Chair and Associate Professor in the Chester F. Carlson Center for Imaging Science. Uh, we appreciate Dr. Bachman's uh, being an ASD champion and along with his staff helping in a large part to plan and co-host today's event. Dr. Bachman will be presenting on the hyperspectral BRDF measurements and modeling of sediment properties using the goniometer of the Rochester Institute of Technology. And immediately following Dr. Bachman will be Justin Harms. Uh, Justin is currently completing his doctorate in imaging science at the Rochester Institute of Technology. He graduated from Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville in 2009 with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering and earned his Master's in Electrical Engineering from the University of New Mexico in 2012. Justin's most recent employment was at the Directed Energy Directorate of the Air Force Research Laboratory at Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico, where he was uh, worked as a laser vulnerability engineer in the Laser Effects Research Branch and as a program manager for the Semiconductor Laser Program. Currently, his, his research is focused on collecting accurate institute spectral reflectance of targets using portable goniometers in the field environments. And he will also be presenting on the a next generation of hyperspectral goniometer system, goniometer of the Rochester Institute of Technology, two. Right. Chip. present 
talking about optical contrast. And so it's quite surprising, but you can actually see uh, some very interesting properties and some complexity that you wouldn't expect just by looking at an ordinary sediment, uh, such as on a beach. So a lot of the things that influence the spectral response are composition, grain size distribution, uh, density, the moisture content, the surface and the pore water. And, uh, Bill's talk later will be uh, focused especially on the moisture content. We understand the directional dependence because we'd like to be able to retrieve some of these additional properties of the sediment uh, to be able to get the density or the grain size distribution or some information about that from the landscape from the directional spectrum. So uh, here's some examples of spectrum we collect in the field of the system. Obviously the wavelength dependence of it tells you something about the composition. That's what ASD has uh, always been uh, geared towards in terms of their designs with their instruments. But we're actually starting to look at something somewhat different. We're looking at the angular dependence, so we're actually going to look at the structure of the response um, as the uh, sensor is buried in terms of its hue geometry and as the uh, sun moves around in the sky throughout the day. So here's an example of a set of measurements that were taken with an ASD spectrometer. Um, they were collected over the hemisphere by grid, and what you're seeing is a plot of these in angular space, uh, where the angle in beta and V is uh, shown here. And uh, we're looking at a specific wavelength, which is highlighted there by the dashed line. So as you can see, there's a lot of structure here potentially, and uh, you can see forward scattered lobes and backward scattered lobes. And these will change as we vary things like density or grain size distributions. And that provides actually information through a rate of transfer model to tell us something about what is underneath here, what is what kind of density we might have for a grain size distribution. Um, a bit of a word about definitions. So if you look in the literature, there's a lot of discussion about what is BRDF. BRDF is actually a catch-all term, of course. Um, it's a very idealized quantity. It's a, a ratio, essentially, between scattered radiance and incoming irradiance. But it is an infinitesimal quantity. And therefore, uh, what we're measuring with a practical system is something that involves a conical measurement or a hemispherical measurement for looking um, outdoors because we have to use skylight and uh, direct solar. So we talk about this as being essentially a hemispherical conical uh, reflectance factor measurement. Um, I bring up these terms because if you read the literature, you will find that they're described in different ways. They're really talking about the same thing. It's just that we're emphasizing in these cases the fact that we're trying to approximate what is a really an idealized quantity. With that in mind, if I use one term or the other, I'm really talking about the same thing. It's just we're approximating. Okay. So let's talk a bit about this instrument and uh, what it does and how it actually accomplishes the measurements that you were seeing in that example. Um, GRIT actually has two onboard stepper motors um, that drive the system in azimuth. So one actually rotates one ring on top of another to move the system in azimuth. The second motor brings the uh, sensor head along the zenith arc. And so we can position the system pretty much between zero and 65 degrees in zenith and, and anywhere we want in azimuth gives us a wide range of ability to uh, measure. It's a fairly field portable system, as you can see. I, in the past, I was involved with much larger systems. This one can be carried by two or three people. Um, as you'll see with Justin's presentation in a short while, we've actually gone quite a bit, uh, put this uh, instrument on a diet, if you will. And so uh, we're down to about 165 pounds with the next generation instrument, even with the two ASDs on, on board. Uh, one thing we did add to this instrument to make it uh, I should say more precise, is to incorporate the idea of putting IMUs on board so that we can actually look and understand where we're actually um, in zenith and in azimuth. Um, one of the things that you can look at a lot of the systems that have been designed in the past, they typically report an azimuth or a zenith, but their actual knowledge of pointing may be quite suspect, maybe a couple degrees off in many cases. So our, our effort here was to try to, to refine that accuracy so that we can rely on the report of the RDF. Um, as was mentioned in, in the previous talk by Brian, uh, we go through a process of, of calibration. So we have a large uh, spectral on panel that is placed uh, in the scene prior to measurement so that we can calculate reflectance factors. This is actually an interesting shot when the NASA G light was passing right overhead head exactly at that moment. Um, we had a second going on during the field in this experiment. The LGS2 was present. Um, this process, as was mentioned in the previous talk, is done, and a sediment uh, gradient sample is collected 
And in order to avoid the problems discussed earlier, we actually um, do a, a dual spectrometer measurement process where we uh, try to use one spectrometer to uh, minimize the variability that we see in the style light. That was uh, the 2012 paper that Brian mentioned. Um, as noted, if you don't do this cross calibration process, you're going to have uh, spectral artifacts that appear because of the wavelength and this registration. Um, it is one of the things that allows us to measure really under um, subpar uh, sky conditions. We've used it for many years, including with this goniometer system and ones that I've worked on before I came here to RIT. Uh, actually, GRID is part of a, a larger global capability that we've developed here within um, the center. Uh, we can actually field this instrument. Uh, in fact, it was driven across the country in this band here, which is actually also a mobile laboratory. So a lot of the work that we do not only involves optical instrumentation, but also geotechnical instrumentation. And we can bring them all to one location, uh, decamp all the equipment, and then set up a mobile lab right there with power and Wi-Fi as if we were actually back here at RIT. It's a tremendous advantage because it allows us to process uh, samples right in the field. And we use that now um, in this NASA campaign. Here are a couple of examples of the kinds of measurements we take in the field from a geotechnical perspective. We're trying to link these measurements directly to um, the observed and directional reflectance measurements. So this is an example of uh, trying to estimate the local density of the sediment. Um, it's called a sand cone field density measurement. And what essentially you do here is to uh, remove a uh, part of the sediment in the location and replace it with a, a known calibrated sand. You measure the weight of bond and you can, you can actually estimate what the density of the removed uh, so sediment was in that location. <laughs> we also, also calculate grain size distributions, moisture content, and a number of other variables that we feel are, are critical factors that influence the reflectance beyond just the material uh, composition. Uh, in the laboratory settings, the instrument is the reason we built it in, in this scale and size was so that we could actually uh, operate the same instrument both in the field and laboratory settings. And so grit, when it's on an optical table, looks like this. You have a rotating light source that uh, rotates over the top, and we prepare samples um, and operate much as, as we would in a field setting, except we don't have a fuse light, of course. Uh, we control the variables uh, individually, uh, such as grain size distribution uh, and density and moisture content. Uh, we'll talk quite a bit in this presentation about the idea of, of density and how it influences spectral response in a directional sense. Um, what we have done here is develop uh, a device that allows us to mimic alien deposition. And so we can rain down the sediment at different rates and the degree of packing is very much controlled by that rate of alluviation um, um, is the, the proper term in a geotechnical sense that's usually used. In case uh, we have control and uh, it allows us to understand some of the data that we actually see in the field context where we have very little control over the samples. Now, uh, I'm going to take you back in time a little bit to some work that Bill Philpott and I did um, a few years ago. Uh, we were trying to understand the uh, scattering properties of sediments. And at that time, uh, we had a very large field goniometer, but it, we could not bring it indoors. And so, uh, lacking a grit instrument, we actually used a very simple um, uh, principal plane goniometer system that we developed uh, just putting two rotational stages together with an ASD. And uh, we were very surprised by the results that we saw because we expected from rate of transfer theory to see that as we densify the material, we'd see more uh, backscatter, more reflectance. And in fact, we saw exactly the opposite. We repeated the experiment a number of times trying to understand uh, what was actually going on and uh, realized that it was a real effect. And we started to look at the microscope pictures and realized, hey, maybe it actually has something to do with the composition. And in fact, what we believed at the time was that uh, we had two different materials with optical contrast, and as we densified them, maybe the multiple scattering was being shut down, and that was what was causing the opposite. We actually saw it um, with greater density, um, less reflectance. So it was quite surprising to us. So we began to look not just to the laboratory data, but also at some of our field data. Uh, this is what we saw in the laboratory. It's actually quite a strong effect and increases with phase angle, it's strongest in the charlotte infrared, as you see in some of these examples here. Um, but we actually had the virtue of having had experiments in a lot of different coastal types, and so we could look at sediments with different properties, some that had a high degree of optical contrast and others that were 
um, or uniform in quality, and others that were somewhere in between, such as these olivine sands in the middle that you see here, which had dark inclusions. And the effect was strongest, obviously, when you had the um, uh, high degree of optical contrast between materials like quartz and magnetite, uh, which you see here on the left. Uh, but when we had something like the inclusions or the low contrast materials, the effect either disappeared or was reversed. So we began to think, okay, the material uh, actually plays an important part of this, the intimate mixture that's there, um, and the ability to uh, densify is now showing us that we're going to see something that contradicts what our naive assumptions were originally. We actually looked in field data and saw the same kinds of things. Uh, we took our very large goniometer system at that time uh, to the field and reproduced exactly the same kinds of measurements that we'd seen uh, in the laboratory setting. Um, these are sites where uh, essentially we had the same moisture content. The only real difference between them was the density, and in this case, the more, the more dense sand was actually less reflective, just as we see in the laboratory. It did not seem to depend on whether we had moisture content present in large or small amounts. The same effect was present, and so we began to believe that this was a real phenomenon. Well, we have also done airborne studies at the same time, and when we looked at the overpasses at different times, which changed the phase angle of these locations, we saw the same thing. Um, and indeed, it increased as the phase angle got larger, just as we had seen with laboratory studies. So it was a real effect. We could see it from remote sensing. We could see it in the field with our portable goniometer system. And we could see it in the controlled conditions of the laboratory. Well, we knew the uh, composition played an important role, but we didn't really know if that was the only uh, factor at work here. Um, more recent experiments that we've done, we've gone back to try to understand this in much greater detail. So here's an example of a sediment from the shore of Lake Ontario that I showed you earlier. Like the uh, sediment that we looked at originally with uh, Bill Philpott, it does have a, a high degree of optical contrast between constituents, so that's very much the same. Um, and so we figured this was the kind of sediment we could use to sort of go back and re-explore some of the issues that might be at work here. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned, of course, is that we have control over density, and with this deposition device that I described, we could control and measure and prepare samples in a very careful way, um, leaving all other variables constant. And uh, what you'll see in a moment or two are some examples of these kinds of measurements. Um, and what we've done, in addition to varying the density, is also look at what happens as we change the illumination angle. And so what you'll see is a kind of a prelude to that is the fact that uh, the degree of multiple scatter changes. And that is a very important factor in whether this mechanism that Bill and I described in the paper um, is actually at play. Let's, let's walk into this for a moment and see. So this is the apparatus. Um, just to orient you to the experiments that I'm going to show you, um, the light source in our experiments, I'm just going to show two cases, one where the light source is very close to Nader, and the other, uh, the second blue star, where it's very far um, away from Nader. And we're going to look at four different prepared densities. So here are examples of the spectral reflectance for those four cases all across the hemisphere, just arranged as a group. I've shown one example here just to kind of orient you what it looks like in BRDF in terms of its angular dependence. All right. So here's the, the first example. And I just want to highlight some of the qualitative factors that you'll see with an example like this. Um, so we're looking from the lowest density here in the upper left, uh, increasing density to the right. And then as we drop down to the, the next row, you know, ever increasing density. Um, and so what you notice right away is that um, the first case, the lowest density that we could prepare with a current alleviation device, we have both forward and backward scattering. There's also quite a bit of off-plane scattering, um, which is really a multiple scattering effect. As we increase the density, um, we now have more well-defined lobes initially. Um, then the lobes get much larger, and eventually it's actually much more forward scattering than it is backward scattering. So overall, we kind of started from something that was somewhat defined in terms of lobes to something that's more forward scattering than, than anything else. This is a short wave infrared wavelength. Let's look at another example. This is much more um, <coughs> stark in contrast in terms of the cases. This is uh, in the green, and so now we start with something that's more backward scattering. And as we progress through these different sequences, we eventually um, produce a forward flow. So things have shifted more in the forward direction as it goes through density. Now, what happens when we raise the light source from a oblique up to a more nadir position? 
uh, it's much more diffuse. Um, more multiple scatterings present. You can see that this uh, same sort of trend towards more backward scatter is still present, but it's quite diffuse. And as we progress through these, we have um, scattering moving towards the forward direction, and it's much more well defined. Okay, they're different, but it's quite clear that when this, the light source is closer to nadir, that it's much more diffuse in general. So we have more multiple scattering. Now, when we looked at the same kinds of plots as we saw earlier, where we plot for a single wavelength um, versus phase, phase angle um, and look at the different densities. In the case where the light source is more bleak and more well-defined and less multiple scattering, uh, we see what Happy predicted in some of his radio transfer models, which is that um, it actually increases as we densify. When the light source is closer to nadir and we have more diffuse scattering, more multiple scattering, it's the opposite. <coughs> and as a result, what we can actually see is that the illumination conditions also play an important role. And the measurements that Bill and I had taken before with those three different sands that you saw were actually more like the ones on the right. They were taken at 20 degrees um, from the scene. So we can either have what I'll call happy-like behavior or non-happy-like behavior. And it really depends on whether we have a lot of multiple scattering present. And it also depends on whether we have materials that have optical contrast. So all these factors play a role. Okay, so that's kind of a qualitative description of what's happening. We're also comparing these directly to radio transfer models. So a lot going on in radio transfer models, and I don't have time in a lecture like this to go through the details of it, but it's important to understand that these have contributions for single scattering, for multiple scattering, and then for also the opposition effect, which is the surge in the retroreflectance direction. Um, all of these terms have dependence on porosity, field factor, are all in there in a nonlinear way. And one of the biggest problems in comparing models like this to the kinds of measurements you've just seen is that there are a lot of free parameters. And so what do you do? Normally people would do some kind of nonlinear optimization. We've actually been looking at a different way of simplifying this so that we can understand whether this is an accurate description of the settings. You can always end up at a local minimum when doing optimization, and you don't really want to conclude from that that you've made a good match to your model. So what we do um, in the laboratory to try to get around this is to uh, essentially constrain the measurement to reduce some of these parameters. One of the ways we've done this is to take our grid system and fix the phase angle. So that's the angle between the light source and the sensor. As we rotate the, the two together, we lock that phase, and what happens is that the single scattering term becomes a constant. We can get rid of a lot of uh, things that we need to worry about at that point and just focus in on two variables. One is the fill factor, and the other is the single scattering of the So that's the important thing to take away from the slide. You can forget about the math for now. You can read the paper if you'd like to know more about it. But uh, this is really the essence of what we're doing. It allows us to directly compare multiple scattering in models like those of Happy to the observed PRDF that's coming out of the grid instrument. And what we see is that as we start to try to optimize those two three variables, the fill factor and the single scattering albedo, um, it works in some of the cases quite well, but it isn't consistent across wavelengths. So you can see a great fit over here at 855 nanometers and 2153 nanometers, but over 420, not so much. And so that tells us that this multiple scattering approximation isn't really faithfully characterizing the actual observed scatter over all wavelengths. So we began to consider what can we do? Um, the issue here is that uh, in Happy's model, which is quite typical, um, multiple scatters assumed to be isotropic. Um, that isn't actually true, but it's a great way to come up with an analytical solution. So what we've done is to reinstall, if you will, some kind of directional dependence, and the result of our mathematical manipulations, which I won't go into great detail about, is that we're treating multiple scatter in such a way that it's isotropic up to the very last scattering point. And in that last scattering event, we're installing, we're reinstalling the single part of the phase function so there's directionality in that last scattering event as it leaves the sediment. If we do that, um, we actually are making progress now with a much better fit. How can we estimate this actual phase function? Well, we can use the original INSA model um, in its form from the data, come up with the first principles estimate, and install it in our modified model. That's sort of the essence of it. Uh, when we do that, we get a much better result over all these wavelengths. 
or realistic um, values of single scattering fuel and fill. So we find this very encouraging because uh, it means that we're actually, we now have a multiple scattering term that makes sense that describes the data we're actually seeing in the laboratory. And it isn't an enormous change from the analytical solution. So we can understand it in a very uh, physical way. So this was a fairly recent work that we did and published in August. Um, the other plus side of this is that going back to the qualitative slides that I started with where I talked about, you know, what do we see when we just plot out the BRDF? Well, when you modify the model, models that we see in radio transfer to include this additional uh, factor in the multiple scattering, we can now reproduce what we call this bowl effect. So that's the off principle plane scattering that we saw. So if you look up here, if you run a Ford model with a Happy's radio transfer model, you see there's some gaps here on, on the sides. Um, it's not possible to fill those gaps with that model that's isotropic for multiple scattering. When we uh, put in this uh, modified form, we actually can fill in those holes. And it looks much more like this um, distribution that we often see. So it's very promising because not only do we fit the data better, but we're actually reproducing uh, in a qualitative sense, or at least in an angular sense, what we expect to see in terms of distribution. So this is where we are right now. Now, um, seen some interesting things. This instrument is great. Uh, we made a lot of headway with it, but what Justin's now going to tell you about is, um, I think, a real quantum leap from this instrument. You notice a lot of problems with this instrument. It has potential for self-shading that is not so great because it has a big zenith arc that's quite thick. Um, it has a full ring, which means that if your sun is over here and it's low in the sky, you can actually cast a shadow right into the place you're trying to measure. There are a lot of issues. We've heard a great talk from Brian about the issue of trying to remove Skylight variations from our data. So the new system is, is going to address that. And without yeah, stealing all this thunder, I'm going to introduce him now and let him tell you about what we call grid two or grid T, uh, which is going to improve all these things. Okay. Justin, why don't you take over? 